are why this table exists. You are also why this channel exists. So I spared no expense with this project to make sure we all gain a thing or two. So let's get comfortable and build a truly one of a kind, gothic inspired trestle base. If you're new to the channel, then welcome. If you are returning, then welcome back. This is the final part of a series on building a complex dining table inspired by the medieval and gothic eras. If you haven't watched part one or two, that's fine. I do suggest going back and watching part one if you wanna see some wicked cool inlay work, or part two covers the stunning Bolivian rosewood tabletop. I'll have a playlist to make it easy on you. I'll use poplar for this trestle base to reduce some of its weight, and then maple will be used for a few important aspects, but we will cover that when the time comes. Lastly, a metal track will be integrated so the table can be expanded into a much larger format. I'm cutting several different thicknesses of poplar and maple to form the different components. Most sections will be made with glue ups, so it's smartest to get those done so that they can cure. Starting off strong, I screwed up. I forgot to leave extra length on a few of the boards for tenons, which is fine, although my OCD isn't so pleased. I can cut new boards, but there's really no point. Instead, I'm going to add large tenons later, so I'll leave hollow ends to make things easy. These will become the two trestle columns. And the arced flying buttresses will be cut out of the next glue up. After the glue is cured, I have to be careful when I'm cleaning up the faces of the columns because I want the shoulders to be equal. Let me show you. Now each opposing shoulder is equal so the tenon will be centered. The columns have several intricate cutaways and beading to enhance some of the gothic feel. So a quick layout will help guide my next steps. While the columns are still simple blocks, it will be easiest to route the straight half inch beads that run the length of the faces. I went a touch too deep on purpose to leave these ridges, which will act as a buffer during sanding. Now I can make some templates out of MDF to produce the cutaways. I can access the outside edges of the columns just fine to produce the outer cutaways, but the hollow arch in the center will be a lot easier if I just rip the whole thing in half, then route the channel. The 
This Laguna air cleaner keeps the localized air around me clean while I route. Notice that I have a block clamped on the tear out side. Trust me, this is necessary. This is definitely where the spindle sander is the most helpful. It makes cleaning up this thick stock a lot more pleasurable, but of course you can do it by hand like I'm doing here. It's worth it to take this opportunity to clean up the mortises because the tenons will be fitted after we route the beading along the edges of the cutaways. I can sand the hard to reach areas now, then fit the tenons and glue Humpty Dumpty back together again. The flying buttresses will act as counter supports for the trestles to reduce racking and will connect to the subframe that holds the metal slides. These will also be cut using a template. There may be some of you thinking that these aren't going to be very strong since they have short grain running through them. So I performed a highly scientific test to come to a concrete conclusion. They're strong enough. I wouldn't lose sleep over it. The L portions of these buttresses are made with two different thicknesses of wood. I came to this result when designing because I need the top supports to be thick enough to connect the subframe to. So I made the bottoms the same, and the sides that attach to the columns look way too hefty if they're the same thickness. So I made these 5 8 instead of 1 inch wide. The arcs will join these L brackets, so I'm using the template to mark where I should cut. I'm about to cut the protruding domino off of each piece so I can sand each buttress perfectly square with the edge sander. In theory though, if yours are already as square as you want them, you can leave the domino or dowel because it will serve as an alignment pin later.
I'll show you both styles in the next clip, one with square edges and one with gothic beaded edges. If you like the beaded edges, I'll of course have a link in the description for the router bit. The footings are made with thick laminated maple. The maple is much harder than poplar, so it'll stand up to kicking, chewing, and chair bumping a whole lot better. I will be cutting a giant mortise in the center of each footing, so once again, it will be a lot easier if I rip Humpty Dumpty in half again. <laughs> While the glue dries on those, we can get the columns finalized. Even after leaving extra ridges, sanding left flat spots on the beads, so some fine adjustment sanding is needed. Now there's a nice shadow roll off. The glue is dry on the footings and there's a bit of shaping to do and feet to add before we permanently connect them to the rest of the trestles. The feet will give the footing some style with a curve, while giving the whole table a more stable platform to balance on. Don't jump the gun yet, we still have to hand cut a mortise into one face of each column for the mid-rail to connect to. We need a mid-rail though. I pre-glued everything together with the tenons in place during the first processes we already covered. This mid-rail is the only other maple component because people will likely rest their feet on it if they so wish. The mid-rail will get the same taper as the footings, but by now I'm anxious to get the mortises cut so I can fit the tenons. So I'm switching gears. I made my fit pretty loose because my design will allow for assembling and disassembling as any traditional trestle table would have. 
Now that I've gotten my fix for mortise and tenons, I can finish profiling the mid rail. I did take into account the tapers, so the tenon is offset to the bottom and not too thick or wide. The tenons will be held into the mortises with pins, but since wood pins would just slip out the bottom over time, I'll use a lag screw for each one instead. Here, I'm offsetting the hole in the tenon slightly so that the lag screw pulls the mid rail tight to the column. It's probably not necessary, but I'm marking each piece with a letter on the bottom so that everything can go back together the same way it was originally fitted. Okay, now we may proceed with the final glue up of each trestle. The bottom flying buttresses didn't really need a domino for alignment. I just pin nailed each end as you just saw. For the top ones, I add a domino to keep that top flush and aligned centrally. Let me know if you think these are looking pretty sweet by hitting that subscribe button. And now we can move to the subframe. The subframe meets up with the arches pretty intimately, so close in fact that it would probably look pretty shoddy if I did anything else than a nice matching arc to complement the marriage of these two pieces. I know that sounds oofy floofy, but just trust me. A fun and accurate way to get these arcs cut is running perpendicular to the table saw blade. I do this in multiple passes with the blade tilted slightly towards me, moving the auxiliary fence until I've cut to my line. There was one unfortunate drawback from cutting the arc this way, and I can't seem to understand why this even happened. This wood is kiln dried, although the sawdust rusted my tabletop fairly badly within minutes, so I actually have to take a break and clean the cast iron before I continue.
This subframe will also be removable using lag screws, but in order to make it easier to assemble, I will add some wide floating tenons that will register into specific spots to hold the assembly in place. This aspect really impressed me because the tenons automatically align the frame side to side and keep it at the exact height needed to install the lag screws, so assembly couldn't be any easier. Now I can take my long drill bit and drill the holes through the frame and into the trestle. With the trestle frame finally finished, I can mount the table slides that I bought from Lee Valley. I am ultimately happy with my purchase, but there are a few funny design flaws that I will mention after we get the tabletop installed. I made sure that the tracks were installed perfectly parallel. The aprons for the tabletop still need to be made. They mimic the footings below, creating a balanced and more or less symmetrical design. Well, I slept on it and I realized that I screwed up big time. One of these cross members is not supposed to be here. The front can remain here because the tracks won't interfere, but the back side, it can't be there and I'll show you why. For some reason, I had a brain fart yesterday thinking that this was all getting mounted on the tracks, but that's not true. It's actually gonna be next to the tracks down here which means this back cross member has to be cut out. It shouldn't exist. Luckily, the fix is relatively simple. Instead of cutting it off now though, it will actually help keep things parallel while I get everything aligned and drilled for mounting screws. Well, that sure doesn't happen often. That mistake actually paid off and really helped with mounting the aprons. So they've done their part and now I can cut them off. By now these tabletops are getting pretty heavy. That Bolivian rosewood is not light. The top is mounted to the tracks with small screws from below. Right now, there's no way for the track to let the top expand and contract, so we will have to remedy this before the end. Mm. 
I also make sure everything still aligns when the three leaves are in place. But here's where things get a little silly. I will admit, these slides do open quite a ways. But I would never see anybody here. This is very flimsy. And I can even see the metal tracks kind of bending a little bit like they're giving way. That's, that's not good. So I love these tracks from about this point forward. They're great, honestly. And especially all the way closed, this thing is solid. So this design goof doesn't really affect you unless you want to extend your table to an ungodly length. Another small issue I personally had is how the tabletop is raised above the track slightly. I know this is to prevent the track from grinding the other side when you close it, but when you insert a leaf, it sits well below the main top, so an easy fix is to add some runners that will hold the leaves at the proper height. I mentioned earlier that there's no way for the track to let the top expand and contract. That's because there are just holes drilled into the flange with no slots cut. Believe it or not though, I have witnessed a high-end table with similar tracks to these survive with no way for wood movement. But since I can't take a single chance on this rosewood top, I'm choosing to elongate most of the holes on my aprons and the tracks. For the black primer, I didn't really care much about perfect coverage. I just sprayed on a few strong coats and sanded away any runs. But for the top coat, I will tape off the outside to protect it from overspray and spray the inside cavities with a small gun first, then pull the tape and spray the outside. And a few days cure time and an assembly later, it's finally finished and it's incredible. Feel free to smash that like button, and it's time for final shots. If I earned it, your subscription is free, and here's another awesome video to watch.